as Andrew mentioned, I finished my PhD in botany at UCP, um, and I now work for the South African Environmental, uh, Environmental Observation Network, or SAIL. Um, and essentially, we're a group that does long-term monitoring and research um, into the impacts of global change on ecosystems. Um, and I, in particular, work with a group working here in Bainbrook, and working on Bainbrook research. Um, so for my talk tonight, I'm quite keen to talk about um, global change and the biodiversity ecosystem function link. Um, this will become obvious in time. Just to set the scene, um, we're here at the southern tip of Africa in the middle of one of these red zones. These red zones all around the globe um, represent uh, biodiversity hotspots. Um, and we're sitting here in one of our very own. Um, we're quite lucky in that we have two. Um, I'm not, as far as I know, none of the other countries have two. Um, so, uh, uh, and together, the succulent Karoo and the Fanbos that you would see, the succulent Karoo that Mark was talking about earlier, the desert to the kind of north of us, and uh, the Fanbos that you see on Table Mountain um, make the greater, greater Cape Flores region. Um, and this contains upwards of 9,000 plant species. Um, I say upwards because we're kind of finding new ones every time we go out in the field. Um, and I doubt we'll ever just figure them all out. Um, but this represents nearly 3% of all plants in the world. Um, this tiny little sliver of red stuff on the end here, you've got 3% of all plant species, um, which is pretty impressive. And then when you go on to see that two-thirds of it doesn't go anywhere else in the world, but the other third doesn't get very far either. We say it's not endemic to the area, but most of it kind of hangs out on some peaks heading a little further north, and that's it. Um, so just to set the scene. Um, Unfortunately, this region is subject to the same kinds of pressures as much of the rest of the world. Um, and just an example here of the city of Cape Town, this is um, urban expansion over the last 100 years. And we've moved from this to this. And I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me that if you're a plant or some other organism, it's not a pretty picture. Um, <laughs> my argument here is that it's probably not very good for us either, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, so habitat loss is a huge issue. This is a, a small reserve out um, towards Sunset West. Um, and you know, this just happened. You know. um, as far as I know, no one's developed this. It was kind of somebody playing around with their bulldozer, as far as we know. Um, so a lot of this kind of issue is an education issue. A lot of people look at a landscape like this, and they don't realize that it's important. They kind of see it as empty space, wasted space. Let's go do something cool over there, like practice driving our bulldozers, for example. Just as an example. So there's a huge education issue. Um, other issues are alien species. This is a stand of pines that invaded in the mountains above um, Greater McGregor and then burnt in quite a spectacular fire. Um, but it just changes everything. It changes the hydrology. It um, uh, alters the, the biodiversity in the area. Um, and changes the fire regime in a big way. Um, and then, of course, climate. I just thought I'd show you this paper because it uh, takes an interestingly different look at climate um, and a look that's far more meaningful for plants and animals in a way. Um, these guys, instead of thinking, well, if you stand at one point, how hot is it going to get? They took the approach of, as climate changes, climate, climate is actually shifting. So as you move up, it'll get cooler. So as it heats, you want to be moving up stay in the climate you want to be in. Um, so they went and calculated the speed you'd have to be moving at to stay in the climate you prefer. Um, and for this, this is for one of the more extreme um, climate projection scenarios. Um, but they found that the speeds you would have to be moving at vary between 10 meters per year to 10 kilometers a year. And, and I'm sure you'll agree that if you're a plant, that's a problem. <laughs> um, even if you're sending seeds out and new individuals are growing up and sending more seeds out, that's a rate of faster than most things can move. Um, and why this is a big concern is that kind of traditionally for conservation, we've gone and said, oh, that's an interesting area with nice stuff in it. Let's put a fence around it. And then we're like, oh, that's great. That's conserved inside the fence. So we can do whatever we like out here. Um, unfortunately, what this means is that everything that we left inside the fence is climbing over the fence on the other side and getting hit by traffic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really have to think about the way we conserve things. Um, it's, it's it's a big problem. It really needs to kind of change our mindset. And so you ask, why should we care? You know, well, you know, all this pretty plants, they're kind of nice. This one's a carnival, by the way, so some of them aren't that nice. Um, but as Mark was pointing out, there are global constraints to the resources that are important for human well-being. 
Um, and many, if not most of these, or most if not all of these, probably is a better way of saying it, are highly dependent on biodiversity and the functioning of ecosystems. Just a few examples um, of some ecosystem services to society. Um, the big one, it's a big topic at the moment, is carbon storage, but uh, all, all the ones we've been talking about for a longer time are things like erosion control, provision of fresh water, um, and then lots of species-based products. So some South African examples are things like rooibos, fufu, um, and ornamental plants like irises, pelargoniums, and proteas. Uh, but probably some more pertinent, pertinent, pertinent examples are uh, everything you eat and most of what you wear. So, um, so there's lots of important stuff out there. So the point of my talk is uh, the biodiversity ecosystem function link and highlighting to you why it's important and how little we know about it. Um, so this is just a very, very stripped down um, conceptual framework for it. In a site, you'll have species composition and biodiversity. These species will have um, traits of some kind that on one hand allow them to grow there, but on the other hand actually change that environment. So if you think of a tree, a tree wants to be tall so that it can capture light and outcompete other trees, but at the same time, it's shading the ground beneath it, so it's actually changing the envi environment it's in. So these biodifunctional traits allow species to be there, but then they also change the processes in the ecosystem, the ecosystem which they're in. Um, and ecosystem services to humans are either provided through these ecosystem processes or directly from the species, as I was talking about before. The big issue is that we're changing the game. Um, as Mark was pointing out, there's all these different things that we're doing, um, and we're changing the species composition and diversity. We're changing the biotic traits that are in an area, and that's the ecosystem processes. And this is kind of leading us with a, a big question about what we're going to end up getting back out of the system. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of try and highlight one of these ideas with some, some research I'm doing here um, in the cave. Um, this is all work in progress and stuff, so I'm not really going to have great conclusions, but I thought I'd just lead you through the process of what we're thinking about and the kinds of research we're doing. So looking at post-fire recovery in Feinbos, um, I'm sure most of you know a little bit about Feinbos, so know that it burns, um, and that hopefully most of you know that it's okay for it to burn sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure you get mixed messages because sometimes we say, oh, it shouldn't be burning. Um, but that's because it should be burning at a particular interval or within a certain range. And if it burns too frequently, that's bad. If it doesn't burn for too long a period of time, that's bad too. Um, but essentially, fire is natural and it um, influences the, uh, the ecosystem services, the ecosystem processes and the ecosystem services that we can gain from that land. Um, so just to put it in our conceptual framework, we have post-fire recovery here as the ecosystem process. But that influences all kinds of things like er erosion control, water quality and quantity, carbon storage, um, fire behavior if you're managing land or you have a really nice house near the mountain. Um, and so what we really need to get a better handle on, we have some idea, but we desperately need to get a, a better handle on um, the biotic functional traits that influence post-fire recovery um, and the species um, that have those traits and how they're, how they're um, all interacting within this, within this link. So when I'm talking about post-fire recovery, of course, I'm just talking about the accumulation of biomass, of plant biomass. This is quite a tricky thing to measure. <laughs> um, this is Cape Point, um, and one option for measuring all the, bio, all, all the uh, biomass in Cape Point is to, to go out, hack everything down, and stick it on a scale and write that down. And um, that wouldn't look very good for me. It wouldn't be good for my street cred anyway, as a biologist. Um, and the other problem it poses is that typically we're interesting, interested in recovery rates. If we went and hacked it all out the first time, we're not going to really have much to measure the second. Uh, fortunately, we have satellites, satellite imagery, and there's various satellite products that we can use to try and estimate the amount of biodiversity, uh, biomass, sorry, um, uh, in, a, in a specific site or across a broader landscape. So these are two images um, of Cape Point. Um, this is before a burn, and this is after a burn in 2007. Um, and you can see there's a, quite a stark difference with this huge area being laid bare by the fire. Um, and we can pick this up from satellite and use various products to, to, to measure how much biomass is actually there. One of the more common ones, there's um, more and more coming up, but one of the more common ones that's been used for some time is the um, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, um, which is essentially a measure of the amount of photosynthesis happening at a site, um, or a measure, measure of the live green biomass, vegetation biomass. Um, and just to give you an idea of how this works, um, 
I'm just going to show you a little video that a friend of mine put together. Let's see if it runs. So this is the seasonal fluctuation in the NDVI signal through time. Um, obviously in winter, summer. And you'll notice that in, uh, in winter it's greener in the west and in summer it's uh, greener in the east. And that's because of the uh, winter rainfall, summer rainfall gradient um, that's happening. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well, but um, you also notice that this patch goes very green and then goes very brown. And the same happens over here. This is the, the Swartland and the Agalis Plains. And essentially that's because those areas are um, croplands that are mostly wheat. Mm. Another thing that you may not be able to see in this is that over here in 2009, we're about to have a bear patch up here. In about two years. <laughs> Keep your eye there. <laughs> um, so there you go. This little patch up here, and then it slowly starts going green again. So, so if we look we at um, one pixel out of this entire image, um, we can get a profile like this, which is a post-fire post recovery curve. Um, so at time zero, the uh, site has burnt, and now we have this kind of projection of recovery um, through time. Um, and from this, we can get things like the recovery rate, we can get the uh, maximum kind of green biomass at that site that we can measure, um, and then of course there's the oscillation from the, um, the seasonal variation. So this, this, this is just a couple of the things we can get, some of the parameters we can get. Um, and time to recovery is often a very interesting one. We can then take this for each pixel and map them back on. CFR. So here's an image showing recovery time in years um, across the CFR. Um, and you can see there's these bright green areas um, in the lowlands. A lot of this is actually farmland, so we should have actually excluded it. Um, but then there's uh, mountainous areas with longer re um, return periods of you know, five to ten years. And then the inland dry mountains like the Swartberg have very long recovery periods, like 10 to 15 years, before you start getting near closed canopy. Um, this isn't, this isn't full, big, tall fanboards. This is just um, this canopy as we're growing together. Um, and these recovery times can be explained by a number of different variables um, before we even think about species and traits. Um, of course, this area is, has such rapid reco recovery times because it's high nutrient soil and it's all farmland now. Um, so high nutrient status is going to uh, decrease the recovery time because things are going to grow faster. Um, and then climate is going to have a big influence. So mean annual rainfall, um, seasonality, maximum temperature, and so on. So we end up with essentially three different things having big effects on the recovery time, climate, habitat, and then species and their traits. So from these big scale maps, we can look at climate and, and habitat um, relatively easily. Um, but getting a handle on the influence of species and their traits is kind of tricky because we don't have perfect maps of where every single individual of every species is across the CFR. Sorry, CFR is the Cape Coast region. Um, so we have to scale this down to the scale at which we can actually go out and count every individual of every species. And uh, this is what we're doing at Cape Point. So this is some work um, that's in progress at the moment. This is uh, 100 vegetation plots across um, the Cape Point section of Table Mountain National Park. And for each of these sites, we can, get, we can uh, use satellite imagery to get these kind of vegetation recovery profiles that I've been talking about, um, and then get the, the estimates of recovery time. These are 5.6, 5.9. Those are in years that it's getting back to cover. Um, we could then go to the sites and we can do vegetation surveys. This is where we actually identify everything and count them all. Um, unfortunately, these sites have a good long record. We've got, um, they were first set up in 1966. Um, they've been resurveyed in 1996, and we managed to go back in 2010 and do them again. Um, and then we measure various species traits um, that we propose to be important. And then we can actually try and tease apart by looking, comparing our survey data with our, with our um, recovery profiles, we can actually start teasing apart, well, what species and what traits are important in determining how quickly this recovery happens, or what the maximum recovery rate, uh, recovery amount gets to is. Um, unfortunately, I can't really show you any answers because we're in the middle of trying to figure this out. Um, but some of the ideas is that um, things like uh, things like fire-stimulated geophytes would be very important in the, in the initial recovery phase. Um, so these are all things that are often very beautiful things, but you see them very rarely because they sit, once the vegetation's old, you don't see them at all. They sit underground as bulbs. Um, and a fire comes through, and they'll come up, flower, put on green leaf, um, and do everything they can as soon as they can before, um, 
before the, the rest of the vegetation gets big and out, out shades them again. Um, another important component of the kind of more weedy grasses, and they're around for the first few years, um, and then kind of start getting out-completed by um, the other stuff as it grows up. And then, of course, many plants aren't actually killed by fire, they're just knocked back. So um, re-sprouting plants don't have to start again from seed, they, they just have uh, starch stored in their roots or similar, and then um, once, uh, once they've been burnt back to a little stock, they, they start growing back again. So this kind of gives you some handle on how one of the ways in which we're trying to look at this biodiverse ecosystem function link, trying to establish what the steps are, what the important processes are, uh, what the important links are important in terms of important species and important traits for maintaining these ecosystem processes um, and ultimately the services for ourselves. But as we said before, we're changing the game. So we're changing climate, we're increasing CO2. Mark fortunately said earlier how um, CO2 has direct effects on plants, so I don't have to go there. Um, and uh, things like nitrogen deposition are also um, having big influences. So we end up with. Uh, we're just starting to get a handle on the, the biodiversity ecosystem function link, um, but now we're changing the game, so we need to know, well, these species and traits are important for ecosystem processes. The next step is to go and say, well, what is all this gonna do to these species and traits? Um, and once we can work out both those links, then we can run it all through and try and figure out, well, what are we gonna leave ourselves with? 